and even more excited when I found out that it would be over 50 people, possibly closer to 100. And it's interesting that when I wrote my introduction that I said I would be completing my trifecta Spartan race this year, for those of you that know what that is, because we actually head out tomorrow to go to South Carolina to do the Beast race, which is the third of the series. So I think I'm more nervous about that than I am about doing this presentation. So that is a 13 mile obstacle course race with some mud involved for those of you that uh, keep up with those things. So I am excited to be here. And as I shared, um, was pleased when I was asked to come because Norval, Nick and I came up with a topic. I've never presented this exact topic before. So you guys are my guinea pigs. I've talked many times about feedback, giving and receiving that, and this was super fun to put together because nobody likes to give or receive feedback no matter how many times you practice. So I will ask at the end that you guys give feedback to see how well you like it. Let's see. The clicker, oh, I skipped. The clicker is not working. Oh, we have the wrong one open. Don't look, everybody close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the handout that you'll get at the end. We need right. to open up the full version here. Close your eyes. Take a nap. Just for a second. Oh, good. They're taking a nap. Am I good to go now? So the feedback that we can give and receive. We're going to learn to apply to give and receive some information and how we give and receive feedback. We're going to identify some steps to create a friendly environment for giving and receiving feedback on an ongoing basis. And at the end, if you choose to accept the challenge, we are going to create a personal action plan for creating our own plan for giving and receiving feedback in the workplace. And normal, my microphone is on. Okay, good. So let's start by looking at what feedback actually is. There's different ways to look at feedback. Feedback in its basic form is the return of information about a result of an activity. So something happens, there's an effect of that action, and then hopefully we get some, we get some feedback on that. Either good feedback where we want to do that again, or bad feedback where possibly we don't want to do that again. So thinking about basic forms, compliments, that's something that we receive that says, okay, that felt pretty good. I may want to do that again. Criticism, on the other hand, says, hmm, that didn't feel so good. I might not want to do that again. But it doesn't really include any details to tell us what we may want to improve or do differently. So feedback can be good or bad. Feedback can also be a dialogue between people, which reflects back how someone else sees us. So that might actually give us a tad bit more information, and it may tell us about our behavior, about our performance, et cetera. So it could give us a little bit more detail, and it can also help us see our blind spots, which all of us have, whether or not we choose to admit that, we do have blind spots, and we can have them at work, and we can have them personally. And what a blind spot is, is something that the rest of the world may know about us that we actually don't know or choose to look into about ourselves. So we just choose to keep those things hidden. We don't choose to explore those because sometimes pulling apart a Band-Aid or kind of looking under a cover or turning over a rock can be very difficult for people to admit and work on. So that's another form of feedback. But if we choose to accept that challenge and we choose to look under that rock and get the feedback, it can help actually help us work on things that can make us more effective. So let's look at the different types of feedback that can be present actually at work because we're not gonna go into personal lives, we're gonna focus on work. And there are a multitude of different ways that we can get feedback at work. The first one is being job performance focused on competency. And this is basically whether or not someone has the jobs, skills, or basic abilities to perform the job that they are actually placed in. So this is supervisor to employee. This is employee to employee. And this could possibly even be employee to supervisor, which can be a little bit risky 
at times, but can be very helpful. And when we look at those types of feedback, that's very powerful because it can actually enhance the overall effectiveness of our organization. And it can actually move the organizational forward in achieving the overall goals. But on the other hand, this can be the type of feedback that could send one of your coworkers to the bathroom crying if we don't handle it appropriately. So we do need to tread lightly and we do have to make sure that we're prepared to deliver proper feedback. A second type of feedback that is prevalent at work is actual workplace behaviors. So this is what's prevalent when we're actually doing our tasks. So this is if we're running a machine, we know if we didn't do something properly if the machine breaks. We know that we didn't do something properly if we make a typo. We know that we didn't do something properly if a customer complains. So these are our actual work behaviors. These are the tasks that we're chosen to perform at work. Um, they can be work reports. So that's how we get information about how we're performing at work. They can show up on our performance reviews that we may get annually. Hopefully we get them annually. Um, and they can be verbal. So there's different ways that we can get that feedback as well. And then there's a third type of workplace feedback. And this one is probably one of the more difficult. Work habits. And this is a person's work habits and personal grooming habits. So think with me for a moment. Maybe some of you work in a cubicle situation. This may be someone who chews their gum loudly, that flicks a pen, if you can hear this. Um, this is you know, the pen flicking. This is someone that talks loudly on the telephone, has extended conversations. This may be someone who has body odor. This may be someone who wears strong perfume. And the list can go on and on and on. Um, and it's one of the most difficult things that you may ever have to do in the realm of feedback when we're talking with coworkers. And it can be overwhelming. So I found a nice comic for us that says, we should have a nice way of telling people that they have body odor without hurting their feelings. Like, I'm bored, let's go buy you some deodorant. That would be a real easy way to address that, but unfortunately it's not really following a proper format and a nice easy way to give feedback, which we'll look at here in a few moments. Um, so just to lighten the mood, I just wanna put a um, quote or a comic in there for us. And this is something that never gets easier. But unfortunately, if you work in a leadership position or a supervisory position, at some point in your career, you will have to address something like this. And if you work closely with your coworkers, in order to not blow your top, you probably will have to address one of the other things like popping gum, clicking your pen, one of those personal habits that just almost drive you over the edge. But we don't have to stress over it. We will have a formula that hopefully will help us ease into the feedback phase. So let's look at the ideal state of feedback. So this is in the ideal world. And I know you guys work with quality, so you like to look at things in this manner, hopefully. So this would be how it would work in our ideal world. Something happens, we give feedback, the person receives feedback, and automatically their performance improves. That's not always the way things happen. The reality is that we as the person that is going to give feedback, we struggle about how to say it. We stress over whether or not we really should give the feedback or not, or maybe things will just magically change on their own. The receiver in the middle there, when they get feedback, sometimes they get defensive. More often than not, they probably do get defensive. And then overall, feedback just really stinks. No matter how often you do it, no matter how often you receive it. It's just, it's just not easy, but it's one of those things that can benefit all of us all the way around if we do that, and if we create an environment where feedback is valued and it's not seen as intimidating. So again, that's why we came up with the topic of going to the dentist. It's one of those things that we all need to do if we don't wanna to have toothaches and we wanna have maintenance and feel good about our smiles, but we need to do it every six months. We need to do it regularly so that we don't have to have root canals, where we don't have people leaving our teams, where we have people that don't want to come to work because they don't feel comfortable. So feedback is something that we want to create. It's just the beginning 
of creating a team that's very strong, of creating a workplace where people want to come to work and where they feel valued. So it is something that we actually do need at work. So why does feedback feel like a root canal? Here are some of the reasons why people fear feedback. Fear, that's the number one reason. It's scary. We don't know how people are going to react to us when we, we start the feedback process, when we approach them. We don't know what their reactions to us are going to be. Maybe we had a terrible experience with feedback in our past. Maybe when we approached someone to give them feedback, they blew up on us. They got very angry with us. Maybe we didn't have all the facts in the past when we gave someone feedback and we felt like we, you know, messed it up royally. We just dread the whole process. Maybe we get sweaty palms when we think about giving feedback. Maybe right now just the thought of giving feedback makes you very nervous. It makes you want to crawl under a table. Maybe we don't want to take care of it at all. Maybe we just hope it gets better. But when we take care of a root canal, it feels better. So when we address feedback with someone, they have the opportunity to improve whatever it is that created the mismatch in the first place. They're going to feel better about their performance. You're going to feel better because you gave someone the opportunity to improve something. And that can make your working relationship stronger. That can help the team move forward and achieve its goals quicker. So we're talking large picture, but just think, if it's a team member that you work side by side with every day, it can strengthen your working relationship. It can build trust within the team. It can help them give you feedback, which gives you the opportunity to be a more effective employee. So we don't want root canals. Why is it important? Overall, people want feedback. I've worked in HR over 20 years. And performance evaluations are one of the most difficult things to track down in most of the places that I've worked. And the reason is most people don't keep good notes. We don't give regular feedback. We kind of put it off. We dread getting the feed, giving the feedback and sitting down and telling people the good, the bad, the ugly about what's happened because we don't do it regularly enough. I always ask people, how do you, do you even remember what you had for lunch last Tuesday? Unless you eat the same thing every day, you probably don't remember that. And that was a personal choice that you made. How are you going to give effective feedback to every employee in your department or everyone that you work with if it's not something that you do regularly? Feedback is also important because it reinforces one's strengths and opportunities for improvement or their weaknesses. So again, it gives us the opportunity as employees to be more effective or even as teammates, as coworkers. You know, I don't want to get on my coworkers' nerves. I would rather for them to just come straight to me and tell me how I could be more effective than to continue to bug them. So just tell me, you know, so that I can be more effective as a teammate. Employees are able to check their assumptions. I don't know about you all, but I can kind of tell when I'm rubbing someone the wrong way. So I would rather for them to have an honest conversation with me so that I have the opportunity to correct that before our relationship goes too far down the wrong track. And if it's simple as correcting a process that I'm doing, I would like to be given that opportunity. And if handled properly, it can be rewarding for everyone. If I give feedback, no matter how difficult it is for me to give that feedback, and it goes successfully, then I'm more apt to try to give feedback in the future. If I give feedback and it goes poorly, but that person and I have built a relationship of trust, then I'm more likely to give that feedback in the future or to give it another try. And if the environment welcomes feedback, then hopefully others are willing to give that a try as well. So let's look at the multitude of types of feedback there is. And there are a lot. Get ready. Feedback can be positive. This is what makes us feel good. Okay, that's positive. I may want to do that action again. And when we give feedback that's positive, we may do that in public, but the caveat is that we want to make sure that we know the person we're giving feedback to. Some people that are extreme introverts absolutely loathe getting any type of feedback in public. 
so you need to know your audience. Negative feedback. This doesn't feel so good. It makes someone feel poorly. A Gallup poll found that people that received negative feedback were 20 times more likely to be engaged than those people who received no feedback at all. So what we're hearing here is that people would rather hear negative feedback than to hear no feedback at all. So keep that in mind because we are gonna talk about negative feedback again in a, in a future slide. Informal feedback. This can be a conversation in the break room. It can be passing in the hallway. It can be a real quick sit down meeting. It doesn't have to be written. It can be formal. This is a planned out process. Typically it is in writing. When we think about this, I typically think about those performance reviews, job evaluations, possibly output reports, departmental reports that show productivity, those types of things. Next, we have the intrinsic feedback. This is something that we tell ourselves. This is the voice in our head, the inner voice. It encourages us to, encourages us to do something in the future or to just continue doing that in the future. So let's pretend that we are a cashier and we hear an unhappy customer making a complaint. That is feedback that we hear, but the intrinsic feedback is that voice in our head that says, oh, I probably don't wanna do X, Y, Z in the future because I just heard that customer say X, Y, Z. So that's the internal feedback that we give ourselves. The extrinsic feedback is the voice of that customer that we just heard talking. So that's feedback from outside. That's also the feedback we hear from our, co from our coworkers, et cetera. Delayed feedback. That's when somebody gets nervous and they wait. They don't tell us for a while. That can be a performance review as, as well. Immediate feedback is real time. I'll give you a perfect example of this. Recently, I was training to be a bar instructor, not a bar like a bartender, but a bar exercise instructor. And the owner of the studio was in my practice class sitting in the corner. And all of a sudden, I'm happy-go-lucky in the middle of my class instructing my students. And she calls out, uh, Sherry, Sherry, I'm going to stop you right there. What's wrong with the lady in the purple form? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, lost my train of thought, first of all. And I look over at the lady in the purple, and her knee is going over the edge of her toe, which is a no-no in any type of exercise class. That is immediate real-time feedback for me. So from now on, I'm going to 100% look at those knees over toes when we're doing that specific exercise. So that is an immediate real-time feedback for me. Frequent. This is ongoing, regular feedback. Don't save it up. Give me regular feedback so I know what I'm doing well, so I know what I'm doing poorly. Um, and no news is not good news when we're talking about feedback with employees. We like to know how we're doing. So we would rather for our managers to give us feedback than to let us go for a year doing something incorrectly and then tell us about it at our performance review. Infrequent, that can be waiting for a year to tell us that we've been, we've been doing something incorrectly. Allow us the opportunity to correct it. And then we have the standard verbal communication which includes our voice tone. And I'm sure most of you have heard the example that uses a simple statement like, I didn't say she stole the money. I didn't say she stole the money. I didn't say she stole the money. So we can send many different messages just by where we put that flexion with our voice tone. So when we're giving feedback, we need to be mindful of, of how we're saying the actual message because the receiver can receive many different messages by one simple statement. Then we have all the nonverbals. And when we're talking about basic communication, most people get most of our messages from our nonverbal communication. So we spend the majority of our time formulating the words that we deliver, whereas most people hear the body language. And that includes crossed arms, slouching, if we're looking at our watch, you know, those types of things, like we're not interested. The gestures, um, if you're working across the room from someone and someone gives you that one finger salute, um, that's a pretty big gesture that I can think of and most of us understand what that is. 
they're not real happy with us in that situation. And then they probably have to go see HR. So facial expressions, you know, if you're talking to someone about good feedback, make sure you tell your face that, that you, your face is excited because that can send a different message as well. And then there's written feedback. So look at all those types of feedback. My goodness. We can send a thousand different messages when we're talking to one person about one specific thing. So it's a lot to think about. Some feedback examples to share with you. Let's look at these for a moment. You are acting very unprofessional. You've been a big disappointment. You never come to work on time. I need for you to concentrate and stop making these types of errors. Many of us may have heard these types of statements in the workplace before. And when we look at those, they're not very specific. They may leave an individual feeling very defeated. They may, in some individuals, cause them to go back to the person that made the statement and ask for more follow-up questions to ask for some specifics. But the general population would probably look at those things and say, I don't feel so good. I'm a failure. Um, I'm not sure I want to work here. I can go get a job at XYZ. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Or I'm going to keep working here and I'm going to quit but not leave. And that's probably not the type of environment that we want to create for our coworkers or for the employees that work with us. So let's look at a few more examples. These are a little bit more detailed. Sally, I overheard your conversation with the last customer. It seemed you were raising your voice. Even when customers are demanding, we want to ensure that we provide high level customer service by remaining calm and asking for assistance from other staff if needed. That's another written example of you are acting very unprofessional. So we've told Sally specifically what we observed. We told her that we understand the frustration and we basically asked her what we would like to see happen in the future, that we would like for her to get assistance from other staff. Down in the bottom right, when you arrive to work late, like you did this morning, it has a negative impact on the team because it creates the need for one of your teammates to stay over past the end of their shift to cover. And we could go on, I ran out of space on the slide, but that gives you a different idea rather than you never come to work on time. It gives what happened, it gives an impact on the teammates, and if we went on, we would say, you know, I need for you to call in, or I need for you to arrive to work five minutes early, or something of that nature. So it, it gives an impact on the teammates, so it makes it more personal in that example. And then the one in the top right, your closed sales have decreased 15% over the last three months. This is creating a shortfall in the departmental goals. Let's discuss the specific reasons you have not met those goals. That's a flip side of you've been a big disappointment. So we've told that person specifically what the performance decrease was. We've talked about the department and the effect that that's having on the overall department, that we actually are not meeting our goals as a department. And then the supervisor or whoever is having the discussion has offered to partner with that person to talk about possibly some solutions to have a discussion with that individual. So instead of saying, you've been a big disappointment, we basically said, you're not cutting the mustard. How can we help? So that it's more of a partnership. So we're still getting the message across, but we're not really de defeating and deflating that person with the feedback. So that, that looks really nice. Let's talk about how we can train ourselves and have some tools available so that we can have provide feedback like that. There's something called the feedback equation, and this will be in the information that you receive. The first thing that we wanna do, instead of just blurting out at someone and start giving them the feedback, because let's be honest, not everyone is ready for feedback when we're ready to give it to them. And feedback can be hurtful. So we want to ask if they're open for feedback. Now that sounds a little robotic, so you need to find your way and your words that you're going to say that. Um, I spent once a whole week in an organizational development training course, and most of the week was actually spent on something very similar to this. 
and each of us had to find our way that we would approach someone to give feedback. Um, so there's different ways to say it. You know, Sherry, do you have a moment? I'd like to talk to you about how our meeting went or, you know, Joe, do you have a second? I'd like to catch up with you and talk about how we could handle the Memphis account differently. And they're either going to say yes or no. And that's them saying that, yeah, I'm open for some feedback or no, I'm not open for some feedback. Um, and of course, I guess if you wanted to, you could say, are you open for feedback? That kind of sounds like, are you open like a store? But hey, you, you use what works for you. Then you observe, what did you see? You state what you saw, you state what you heard, you state what happened. Then you share the effect it had on you personally. So you, you make it really kind of about you, about the team, about the organization. And then you suggest an alternate behavior. And if it's appropriate, like we saw in the previous slide about talking about the, where the person was falling short on the goals, you open it for dialogue, but that may not always be appropriate. So let's look at an example. Hey Joe, do you have a minute for some feedback? In the meeting, when you called me out in front of the other staff members saying that I was underperforming, I felt really embarrassed. Next time, I would really appreciate it if you and I could discuss those items one-on-one -on -one instead of in, in front of the whole group. And then Joe can either say, oh, I didn't even recognize I did that, or that's not what I meant at all, or, well, you know, they may place blame somewhere else and say that, well, you know, my boss asked that I bring that up in that meeting so that everybody could be aware. You really don't know what's going to happen after that conversation, but at least you have handled the feedback process appropriately from your end. So that's, I put the little graphics there so you could see how it breaks down by the by the feedback equation. And that'll be in your handout as well. So here's another way to think about it. And when I worked in an office, I actually had this bottom part printed out and placed on my bulletin board so that I could remember the appropriate format for me to give feedback. So when you blank, it makes me feel blank. And in the future, I would appreciate it if you blank. So using the Joe example. So Joe, when you call out my underperformance in the staff meeting, it makes me feel really embarrassed or it makes me feel really inadequate. And in the future, I would appreciate it if you would talk to me about those things before we go into the meeting in front of everyone so that I'm aware that it's gonna be shared in front of the group. So you can put anything in that equation and it makes it feel less attacking than if I went to Joe after that meeting and said, Joe, what in the world are you doing? That was so embarrassing. Why did you have to tell everyone in that group that I didn't meet my numbers last month? Because then that could very easily turn into a conflicting situation. Um, whereas this, I've put my feelings into it. I've opened up to Joe and I've told that person how I feel and that softens it a little bit. So that can often be a way to enter into a feedback conversation gently. So some tools that we can use when preparing feedback, because we always want to be prepared. Feedback tells what happened. It talks about where and when it occurred who was involved, how it affected others, and what, what you hope to see in the future. So those are some things to consider as you're preparing to put together some feedback. So this would be more in-depth feedback than just a one-off situation like I shared in the meeting. So this would be feedback from someone that you work with side by side on a daily basis, where you're seeing a pattern or a routine is developing, or this might be a direct report where they're continuously making mistakes that need to be addressed, etc. And we want to recall as much information as we can and we want to be as specific as possible so that person has the opportunity to change their behavior so that they can be successful. So feedback is about going to the dentist in this presentation. So we need to reflect a little bit 
about our preventative routine, how we've been brushing our teeth, et cetera. And before we can actually go into the conversation or go to the dentist, we need to think about ourselves. Why did I notice this behavior? What does it say about me? Am I just judging the person? Or am I actually looking at their work behavior? Am I looking at how they're performing their work? Or is it just a personality conflict? Because we should not be giving feedback on their personality or on what happens outside of work. We should just be providing it on what happens within inside the four walls of the work environment or across the phone lines or what, what have you. What nonverbal feedback am I giving or am I preparing to give? What tone of voice would I like to hear if I were getting ready to receive the feedback that I'm preparing to give? And then have I removed my emotions from the situation? And if I can't answer that question with a yes, then I'm not ready to give the feedback to the other person. Because feedback is hard. The person that's going to receive the feedback may get emotionally upset or emotionally charged as well. So I can't enter into a feedback giving situation if I have emotions involved. I need to detach my emotions from the feedback situation. Signs that it may be time for a crown, that I waited too long to give feedback. If I find myself complaining constantly to someone else about it or about that person, if I avoid talking to the person or I see them coming into the break room and I run the other way, if I feel frustrated, if I can't stop thinking about it, if I'm obsessing, or what, you, what, what I know I'm making assumption about or I'm starting to explain away or I'm apologizing for that person or for their actions, then it's definitely time for me to give that feedback or find a way to give that feedback. I have waited well past the time to give feedback. So an effective treatment plan, these are the do's when we are giving feedback to someone. You will get this as well. Do describe the specific behavior or the situation. Do acknowledge the impact on you or your department. Do provide the feedback in a timely manner. It's not gonna be effective if somebody comes to you and talks about something that happened six months ago. You're probably not gonna remember it. Again, we talked about that, what did you eat for lunch on last Tuesday situation. Do check for understanding to make sure you're on the same page. Share your feelings to talk again about that impact. Only talk about one thing. Don't do an ambush because that's gonna be very overwhelming for someone. And then be sensitive because the likelihood of someone getting an emotional reaction to receiving feedback is going to be pretty high. An ineffective treatment plan for someone. These are the don'ts. Don't be squishy. Don't beat around the bush. If you've got feedback, well plan it, think about the message, and deliver that message. Don't accuse, because remember, we're going to go in with our facts and our observations. This is not a time to pass judgment. Don't talk for everyone else. We're only providing feedback on behalf of ourselves. It's not about you. So don't use your personal examples or start rambling on about, well, there was this one time when somebody talked to me about blah, blah, blah. Feedback is difficult. It makes us nervous to give feedback. And sometimes that creates a feeling of us wanting to fill in the blanks, but that's not appropriate. The person is gonna be processing the information that you are actually giving them. So, so allow them that space. Don't generalize with the always and the never. Again, provide specific examples for the person so that they can process and have the opportunity to improve from that. Don't give them advice. And then contrary to what you may believe, there's much recommendation, and I tend to believe the recommendation that we should not use the sandwich feedback approach. Granted, it does feel easy, but here's the reasons why. Whoops. Huh, I'm gonna skip over it and not tell you. There's a book out there called Smart Leaders, Smarter Teams. And it shares with us that the assumptions are, when we're looking at feedback, that negative feedback is easy to hear if we sandwich it with some positive. That negative feedback needs to be balanced with positive feedback. And then we use positive feedback to kind of ease into the negative. And that might reduce the discomfort and anxiety for the person that's gonna hear it. 
But the actual findings in this study or this book are subordinates only want to hear the negative. They don't need the positive at that point. Give them positive throughout the, the working environment, throughout the working day, throughout the working week. Give them the positive on their evaluation. The supervisors say that easing into it creates more anxiety on their part. Let's just cut to the chase. And then the employees say that they sense the supervisor is easing to it, that they're easing into it, and they, that makes them more anxious. So just, just tell me the message already. Let's stop beating around the bush. Just give me the information so we can get on with it. So that's one study, and you know, opinions are very popular, but that's what this book believes, and from many things that I've heard, that's the recommendation. So the types of feedback that we can give are peer-to-peer, -peer, and some of the information that they have there is that we need to have key elements. Again, what's the facts? What was the observation? It can provide a personal development opportunity for those that we work with so that they have the opportunity to improve. That when we receive feedback from a peer, we have to assume that it is in good intent, that it's providing an opportunity for us to improve. That when we are going to give feedback to a peer that we need to be prepared, that it is recommended that we understand the receiver's preferred style to receive feedback. Some people like to have it informally. Some people like to receive a lot of detail. Some people are gonna ask a lot of questions. But no matter how we give the feedback, as it recommends in the book, get to the point. Direct report to supervisor. Again, this is scary territory. Um, but ask for permission. Follow the feedback equation. Be honest and specific, but always be constructive because remember, they are your boss. Take some written notes because chances are you're gonna get nervous when you're in that meeting with your boss so that you stay on task. Focus on your perspective. Let's not talk on behalf of the whole department. Choose your appropriate delivery method. Resist the urge to send it in an email. Face-to-face -face is gonna be more appropriate because you can read their body language. You can go in with a smile. You can make it non or unintimidating. And then schedule a time so that you're not just giving the feedback on the fly. Supervisors to direct reports, and this is pretty standard, but the recommendation is that it's ongoing. No news is not good news when we're talking about feedback because we could go on for a year, again, making the same mistakes. We're looking for SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound so that we know that we are achieving what they are asking us to do. Be open to feedback if you're a supervisor, because again, you want to walk the talk that we are asking employees to do. And then ask questions. As a supervisor, what can you do to help? How can you provide support for your team? And then follow through with whatever feedback you receive. Follow through with whatever support your direct, your direct reports have asked for, so that you can make sure that you are providing the support that they need. So to continue to build an environment that values feedback, because again, so many times we go to trainings or we attend seminars, we get all of this great information, the next day we go back to work and it's business as usual. So we forget everything that we invested in. So to create an environment that actually values feedback and moves the needle, if you will, we really need to strive to create an environment where we trust each other and that we're not gonna you know, stab each other in the back if we do ask for feedback and then feedback is given, that it's okay to talk about emotions and that they're gonna be valued because again, that intent and the way I receive something is part of the feedback equation. Where we do give more praise and recognition because we do need that, but we just don't wanna give that at the time that we're giving that constructive criticism feedback because that kind of muddies the water with feedback that we wanna make sure that the feedback is specific to behavior. And then we should try to ask for feedback because we shouldn't just wait for it to fall out of the sky. So the reasons we avoid going to the dentist or asking for that feedback is that oftentimes people don't know how or they don't know when to ask for feedback or they don't know who to even ask for feedback. 
So that may be one of the reasons why feedback is not, not really given or received within a lot of the workplaces. And sometimes people don't think we should have to ask for feedback, that it should just be given. But if it's not a two-way street in all organizations, it's not going to be just freely given. Sometimes we fear that we might actually hear the truth. So maybe that's why we don't ask for feedback. Well, if I don't ask them, they're not going to tell me, so I can just keep doing it this way, which is very comfortable for me. Sometimes we fear the consequences of asking. Ah, maybe they're going to blow up. Maybe they're going to be angry that I asked for the feedback. Um, maybe nobody in this organization has ever asked for feedback before. Maybe I'm doing the unspoken. But that's okay. Be a renegade. Be different. But once we ask for feedback, we need to be sure that we can deal with the feedback. We need to be prepared for it. We need to really think about who we're going to ask before we do that. What if they tell us no? What if they're not comfortable to give us feedback? We can't hold a grudge against them for, for the rest of the working relationship. We have to be okay with that. If they do say yes, that they would be open to giving us feedback on a regular basis, that's going to be most effective. We need to be open with them and tell them why we would like feedback. How would we like to receive that feedback? Do we want to have regular meetings? Are we okay with it informally? Um, do we have specific questions that we would like for them to ask? One of the things that I need to work on is my poker face. So when I was in my most, my most wonderful work environment, I had a partner in our management team and I would ask for feedback about my performance in our management team meetings. And we got really good and really comfortable about giving each other feedback in those meetings. And I felt like that was one of the most high performing relationships I had because I got awesome feedback from that person. So I would encourage you to think about doing something like that if you are open to it and if you're open to taking it seriously. Whoops. So one of the things that I can't ever talk about feedback without saying is that feedback is a gift. And you may or may not have heard that before. Because feedback is something that we can either choose to give someone or we can choose to not give someone. And what that means is, we all observe things and we think that we know things about people that we work with every day. And we can choose to give that feedback to someone as a gift, which gives the person the opportunity to improve and change their behavior so that they can be more effective. Or we can keep that gift back and we can say things that some people may think to themselves, huh, I'm just going to let them derail themselves and continue to do these things and not be effective. And I'm just going to sit back and watch and see what happens because they are eventually going to step in it or something of that nature. And maybe the person will, maybe the person won't derail, but they keep the gift back and they don't share that. So when someone gives you feedback, they're actually giving you an opportunity. They're giving you a gift. Now, when you receive that gift, you can choose to take it as a gift. You can choose to give the gift away. You can choose to throw the gift away. It's your choice. But I always encourage people to take it as what it is for face value because they did not have to give you that opportunity to make the improvement. And it is difficult to hear sometimes that feedback. But the normal steps are that we may get defensive, then we step back and we process that feedback. Then we take the opportunity for real change. And that's where the change happens after we go through that three-step process. So once we receive the report card and they're giving us that gift, we want to listen carefully. We don't want to fight or flight it. We want to ask for some examples if we need them. Let's assume it's constructive. Ask them if they have suggestions for us to improve. Respect them and thank them for giving us the gift. Reflect on the feedback, and then if we choose to keep that gift, try to implement it so that you can improve. We all need people who will give us feedback. That's how we improve. That's a quote from the famous Bill Gates. So I would encourage you to think about that. And then lastly, and this will be in your handout, if you choose to take your annual checkups, 
which is your personal action plan. As I mentioned, I did with my person in the management meeting, identify people in your organization who you would trust to give you feedback. Schedule a meeting with them. Use this webinar as the, as the springboard for doing that. Explain that feedback is a two-way process and invite them to participate with you. And then provide an introduction of what you'd like for them to do. Identify something that you feel like you need to work on or maybe something that you've received feedback on in the past. Ask them for honesty and then tell them how it will assist in your development. And then make it happen. If you're gonna ask for the feedback and you're gonna go through the process, make sure that it happens and take it seriously. And if you do, I think that you will see improvement. And then once you feel like you've really worked on that, take a focus in a different area. And I think it'll help you. It helped me with my poker face. So now that's the end of the formal presentation that I have. We have just a few minutes for questions. Um, for the main action items, I do have a, a smaller version of the PowerPoint, which I'll give to Norval, and he will be able to, I think, PDF that and email that out to the attendees. Yep. So at this point, if you have any questions, I think you can type them in your chat box, and I'll open it up to the questions. Thanks very much, Sherry. Uh, we do have the chat box open, so if you do have questions for Sherry, uh, please uh, go ahead and, and enter them now. And if not, I thank you for your time and attention. And like I said, it was fun putting this together. So if you have feedback for me, please feel free to share. I enjoy putting it together. Oh, there you uh -oh, go. Oh, there was one. Okay. Do you have recommended actions when feedback is not received well? Absolutely, because not every single feedback session is going to go well. What I would recommend if you have prepared feedback and the person does not receive it well, that you schedule a follow-up session with that person, um, that you thank them for receiving your feedback and ask them to just take some time and think about it and process that and then follow back up with them. And maybe they are gonna share some things with you because let's be honest, like I said, um, Feedback is a process. When you hear that feedback, it's normal for us to deny that feedback and disagree with it. And then once we can take a step back and actually process what the person has given us or shared with us, 74% of the time, if we're honest, that person is right. They're telling us something that we already know, but we may not wanna hit it or address it face on. So then if we can follow back up with that person, they may be open to problem solving with us or hearing our information. Okay, there's your next one. What do you do when the person hears your feelings and it makes them feel as he's not successful, so he would choose to be distant? With that, if a coworker kind of pulls away because you've been honest and share your feedback with them, I would say, Try to continue to work with that person and partner with them. At the end of the day, we can only be responsible for our own actions. And that is a tough pill to swallow, but I would not avoid that person. I would try to continue to work with them. I would try to continue to approach them, not to the point to where they're going to feel uncomfortable or file a complaint because, you know, I've been stalking them in the workplace. But at some point, I think I would be honest with them and say, I've, I've noticed a difference in our working relationship since I provided that feedback. And I just want to know if there's anything differently that I could have done or if you would like to provide me any feedback. I would open up the door for the feedback to come back and see if that makes any difference. Do you find the approach to giving feedback is different based on gender or generation? Um, for the gender question, the third situation about dealing with a personal situation, I think that is one that you would want to be aware of. Um, you know, if it's a body odor situation or personal hygiene, that may be one where you want to be aware of gender and who's addressing that situation. But if it's general workplace situations, I don't know that I would consider that a gender issue or a generational issue because we're talking about performance how you're receiving things in the workplace, and it's really about you and what you've observed. So I would say no to that unless it's the hygiene and those types of things. 
What about when it's not giving well by given well by your boss? Does that mean when your boss gives feedback to you and they don't give it well? Send them to my course or have me come speak to your business. <laughs> um, I, again, we're all only responsible for our own actions. So you can ask them for more information. You can ask them for more specific details or if they can give you some recommendations for how you can do things differently. But I mean, we, we can't really force them to do things differently. We can thank them for the feedback. Anything else? Looks like that was probably the last question in the chat box. Okay. Uh, does anybody at Stanton home base have any questions for Sherry? No. No. Okay. All right. All right. Well, with let's see, make one last check here. Um, oh, there. Whoop! Thought we just saw one. Hold on, let me back up here. Yep, there you How go, you one more. Feedback related to attitude. Ooh, attitude is one of those things that's more difficult to address. It's not a specific, and I've got my HR hat on answering this one. That is not a specific task or thing that we can observe related to a performance-based issue. That is a gray area. So I would recommend that you try to tie that to something specifically related to a task behavior, observation, something that you can actually see in the workplace. So like an interaction that you've observed with a customer, an interaction that you've seen with another coworker, if there's been yelling involved or something of that nature, something that's going to be very specific and fact driven because attitude is one of those HR squishy things that, that we really, it's very difficult to address that. So that's probably not the answer you were looking for, but that's with my HR hat on. Okay. You're welcome. Oh. Okay, well, it looks like it's a minute past uh, the hour, the second hour, or into the second hour, so uh, we're gonna end it here for right now. Uh, we'd like to remind you once again, uh, World Quality Day is one week from today on November 9th. <laughs> And we will have uh, Susan Schwartz here uh, presenting uh, webinar, uh, Military Generals, Mindfulness and Emotional Intelligence. Uh, we hope you can join us then. Uh, and that'll be at 12 noon Eastern time on Thursday of next week. Uh, until then, we'll hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>